Welcome, everyone. I'm Susan Vita, the Chief of the Music Division here at the Library of Congress. This is a great evening of celebration. First, we are announcing the donation of the Jesse Norman Papers to the Library of Congress. The music division is thrilled to add them to our collections, and we are so grateful to Ms. Norman for entrusting them to us. Her papers will stand alongside one of the premier collections of opera scores and libretti in the world, as well as the papers of many important opera singers. Ms. Norman's legacy of supreme musicianship, flawless technique, and selfless philanthropy will be available for study and will be a continuing source of inspiration for music scholars, aspiring students, and opera aficionados for years to come. Before you leave, please be sure to take a look at items from that collection and also other items from our collection, which are displayed in the foyer of the auditorium. We also would like to thank Juliana Richardson for her assistance in introducing us to Ms. Norman. Juliana is the founder and executive director of the History Makers, a national nonprofit educational institution committed to preserving, developing, and providing easy access to internationally recognized archival collections of thousands of African American video oral histories. Juliana, can you raise the lights for a second? She can. Thank you. But the second reason to celebrate is simply having the privilege of welcoming Jessie Norman to the library and to hear her in conversation with the Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden. Both women have achieved great heights in their careers and have amazing stories to tell. We have been looking forward for a long time to this evening, We've, um, and we couldn't be more excited to be in the audience tonight and now, let me introduce Dr. Carla Hayden and the incomparable Jesse Norman. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello, hello. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. What a lovely reception. Thank you very much. Ms. Norman, this is truly an honor. Oh, you are very kind to say so. Truly an honor. Honestly. And to think that your collection will be housed at the Library of Congress. For me, it's completely surreal. <laughs> I remember, and I have to also give uh, deep appreciation to Ms. Juliana Richardson. Yes. Uh, her program is called History Makers, but she's actually a history connector. Yes. And when she uh, made sure that we could visit you in New York, mm -hmm. and Sue Vita, who just gave that lovely introduction, yes our head of our music department. I've never seen her so excited. <laughs> oh, wonderful. She couldn't believe it. And then you so graciously started to show us some things. What, what, what made you think about this gift? Because it's truly a gift to the nation and the world. Well, that's very kind. Um, when one is going along performing, um, you're not really thinking about what's going to happen with your programs and your information and your papers. You're just doing the work. And then to have someone suggest that they would like to have your papers, you think, really? Um, <laughs> I've written all over everything, and it wasn't always sort of the best remark I make about something. And um, people are going to read that. Is that all right? Um, but I soon became very comfortable with the idea because I think is it important to know, uh, for instance, that I've probably written in the back of a score, the rehearsal went well, 
let's hope the performance is as good because we were good today. Or at an instance when I might have written, gosh, I wish we had more rehearsal. <laughs> I've probably written that more than anything else. And so to think that there will be generations to come that will possibly look at a video or something of a performance, but then be able to see those notes. Yes. And make that comparison or to yes. say, wow, this is what she's thinking. Now, as a librarian, you know, I had a chance to reread your book. Thank you. And if you haven't, and I can give recommendations for some things, so this one you definitely have to read. Thank you. Stand up straight. Stand up straight. And sing. And sing. And you said your mother told you, and you, you, I have to show the inside cover of this <laughs> lovely, lovely book. And she would tell you that. What? My mother would tell me that, you know, at age sort of five or six, when one has the tendency to slouch a little, perhaps. And um, actually, she was a, a teacher, so she wouldn't have been happy with my sort of having as a title something that was directly incorrect. Because what she actually said was stand up straight and sing out. <laughs> ah, so she was quite an influence. Yes. And so with that kind of, uh, that phrase for you, what did it mean? Because you talked well, about it. Well, it. it meant, of course, you know, to stand up straight and, and sort of make a joyful noise when I was a child. But of course, later on in life, it became very clear that standing up straight and, and singing was not something that only singers do that there is so much that goes on in the world outside of our own disciplines for which we have to take responsibility as citizens and that we have to protest nonsense, evil. <laughs> the lack of humanness, the lack of tolerance, I have to say, um, I don't know how many professors from our university might be here, but there were many times when I had to rearrange my class schedule because we had to go down and protest the Vietnam War. And growing up in Augusta, Georgia, I was lucky not to grow up in Selma, Alabama, or Montgomery, where things were hot, it would seem, all the time. But there was enough reminder of segregation and Jim Crow's laws in the city of Augusta to remind us on a daily basis that we were not considered full citizens. And even at a very young age, I questioned that. There was an opportunity when I was very young, must have been what, four or five, and we were going up on the train, my family and I, uh, to visit our relatives in Philadelphia. And we were gonna take the train all the way which I just adored, I just loved riding on trains. And in the uh, train station, and of course there was a section sort of colored and white. And it was not a very busy day, and so there was no one sitting on the white side. And so of course I got up from my chair and went to sit on the white side. And I said to my mother, the seats are the same. <laughs> <laughs> And so then to be absolutely certain that I knew what I was talking about, I went over to the water fountain that said colored and turned it on and said, mm-hmm. And then I went over to the other section and turned on that water. I said, now what is this about? Because certainly if the chairs are the same and the water is the same and we're all going to get on the same train, perhaps not sort of sitting in the same section, what does this mean? And I was explained to me very carefully that segregation was legislated apartheid in this country. And that even as a very young child, I understood that it was wrong. And I still think it is wrong. I know that it is wrong. We all know that it is wrong. But that we would have had legislation that would have decided that separate but equal was a nice idea. Can you think of anything more stupid? <laughs> were useless. So the idea of protesting against what I saw and understood as being an injustice was something that I understood and was doing at eight or nine years old. So by the time we needed to protest within the civil rights movement and refused to go to 
a, a restaurant, certainly, or to anywhere where the jobs that were offered to African Americans were only menial jobs. That you didn't see a person in a grocery store that, that looked like me. They would be a person that was either opening and closing the door or giving you your shopping cart or you know, saying have a good day because they're helping you put your groceries in the car. And so when we decided, I think I was, must have been about 10 at the time, that there was a big store, it's still, it's still in Augusta, it's called the Fat Man's Corner. And it's a great big store where they sell all kinds of stuff, you know, all kinds of groceries. You can buy Christmas decorations in April, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so it was in mostly a black community, a black neighborhood. And but still, even though there were all these shoppers that looked like me, they didn't have anybody that looked like me that was at the cash register or so they're helping you to find whatever it was you were looking for in that store. And so I was pleased to be a part of the protest against this particular market. And we stopped, for instance, a bit later on, sort of taking the Augusta Chronicle, because it's still right-wing, and it was even more right-wing, if you can imagine, in the 60s. And so we took the Atlanta Journal and Constitution. And so there were things that were done in a very seemingly small way that taught me that it was important to say, no, this is right and this is wrong. So by the time I got to Howard University and the Vietnam War and everything else seemed to be on fire, it was not difficult for me to say, well, I need to go and see if I can take that class later in the week because I have to go downtown. I have to hold a sign. And even after that, when I was a few years older and working in Munich, Germany, I always say that there will be no film found of my holding a sign against the Vietnam War unless I run for office. <laughs> then they will be found somewhere, there I am, in a foreign country, protesting the Vietnam War, and there you are. I've never seen one, but I know they must be somewhere waiting to be used. I think there are people that would like you to, to run. <laughs> <laughs> now, in your book, and you talk about your mother saying, stand up straight and sing, you talk about the influence of other strong women and your mom being a teacher and that education. Did you just elaborate yes. on the strong women that were in your life? Well, there are a lot of strong women on both sides of my family. And I just thought that's the way women behaved. I didn't know that uh, my Aunt Louise on my father's side of the family, um, who spent a lot of time going back forth to Ghana um, and wearing wonderful sort of dress from Ghana, I thought that was just the normal way that life worked. And another aunt on the other side of the family became a preacher. And she had her own small congregation. And she uh, somehow became a bishop in Atlanta, Georgia, in this congregation. And she wrote books about, about life and understanding of faith and so on. I just thought that's what aunts did. <laughs> I didn't understand that this was something from which I was learning a great deal about what it means to participate as a full citizen in this world and to, to try to contribute something and to try to understand other countries, to understand the motherland, to try to understand Africa and to try to understand what it must have been like, if one could imagine it, to be walking free on your own property and someone puts a net over you and puts you in the bowel of a ship where you're there for months. And you're brought to a country and sold as though you were a horse, not as much money as a horse. I have to acknowledge practically on a daily basis 
the things that my ancestors have gone through so that it would become possible for me and, and certainly lots of other African-American classical musicians to say, yes, I will sing that. Thank you very much, but I won't sing this. And that has come from a legacy of people who simply decided not to bow down, that life was, I can't even imagine the difficulty of life in such situations. But somehow, survival was the important thing. It's very interesting, I'll, I'll digress a moment. It's very interesting to look at the hundreds and thousands of spirituals that were written by people who were learning a language for the first time and being taught by people who were not educated, so they were not being taught the language properly. Imagine sort of coming from several different tribes, and there you are on a plantation in South Carolina where you can't really, you can't really speak together. So you invent the drum, because you've brought the drums with you. You find that you can communicate with people from different areas, from different plantations and that they would respond. And then somehow the overseers discovered, aha, that's a way of communication, so let's take that away. But then the humming started, and that went from place to place as well. And then enough of the language was understood to have the spiritual to come to be. There isn't anywhere in this world where I've had the privilege of performing where people don't want, it doesn't matter where I've sung the Liebestone, the four last songs, a whole cycle of music by Brahms or whomever. Could you sing a spiritual, please? There was an <laughs> instance where in Japan, um, we'd done the four last songs and the Liebestone on the same program. I must be crazy. <laughs> and two people came down to the front of the stage and said, um, could you sing a spiritual? And so I said, um, is all that just died? <laughs> I don't think it would be theatrical to get up and sing again. Uh, but I did win that argument, <laughs> and I've never won that argument. But the legacy of this music is something that gives me strength. My grandmother particularly hummed and sang practically all day long. And as I write in my book, you could just about tell her mood and how she was thinking about things as to what kind of spiritual she would sing. And it is remarkable that now in my own life, with so many other things to do than raise 13 children as my grandmother did, I find myself finding comfort and just humming a spiritual to myself. It is crazy. It is in my DNA. It is there, it is inside of me. It has helped to make me me. And I am, I am so grateful, I cannot, be, I cannot begin to tell you. And it's important to notice, I wanted to say at the beginning, in a spiritual, there is no thought of revenge, there is no thought of, I'm going to get you for doing this to me. There's only thought of plenty of good room. I'm going to be there one day. When I get there, I'm going to put on my robe. I'm going to put on my shoes. And I'm going to shout all over God's heaven. You will not find one single spiritual that has malice. Not a one. And there's thousands of them. That is strength, and I draw from that on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so, how did you begin your professional opera career? How well, the way that I began my professional opera career, if this had not happened to me, and someone told me this story, I said, oh, stop. 
By now, I was a graduate student at the University of Michigan, and I received an invitation, as did lots of singers all over the country, to come to New York because a very wealthy um, industrialist from Cincinnati called J. Ralph Corbett um, had a wife who had wanted to become a singer and for various reasons had not become a singer. And she decided that rather than having American singers traipse all over Europe to the various 50 opera houses uh, looking for work, that since she and Ralph could afford it, that they would bring 30, 30 general directors from opera houses uh, all over Europe to, well, to New York for two weeks on their dime where they would have to sit on a daily basis and listen to American singers. Uh, they will wind and dine in the evening, but during the day, um, that's what they had to do. And I received an invitation to, to go to perform in this. And um, as luck would have it, I, it was raining. And I was wearing my hair in a different way. And of course, by the time I got there, I looked like a wet dog. <laughs> and so I was trying to sort of get myself organized and to, be, to look like I knew my music, which I did. And of course, we were just, it was like a kind of, I don't know, sort of a chain of singers. You had a certain time when you meant to show up and sing, and then you would sing and sort of leave. I mean, there was nobody backstage saying, would you like to sing now, Miss Norman? No, no, no. It was 12.10, so that was time when you were supposed to sing. And the door opened, and there you went out onto a stage with a few people sitting in an audience and a pianist with whom you were working for the very first time you never even met. And um, so I gave him my music and talked about the tempi and so on, and sort of sang my music and sang my songs. It just happened that one of the songs that I loved most of all was an aria from Elisabeth and Tannhäuser of Wagner. And it's not the one that everybody knows, not that one. <laughs> <laughs> but the one that we singers know is actually more difficult because it, com it calls for complete breath control. It is in the third act of the opera and it's only accompanied in the orchestra by the brass. So anybody who sort of sings this role knows that that's really the difficult aria. And uh, because I was so naive, for heaven's sakes, I was 21 years old, um, I sang that. And of course, it went after I'd finished my singing, my time was up. So I went back into the little dressing room and was gathering my things to go back out into the ring. And at that point, a very tall gentleman came in uh, sort of speaking sort of wonderful English with a German accent, and he said, I liked very much what you were doing. <laughs> and so I said, thank you. And so then he introduced himself, and he introduced himself as Egon Seyfelner, the director of the Berlin Opera House in West Berlin, uh, the largest opera house in Germany at the time. And he said, um, I'm just looking through my file of facts. Does anybody remember what a file of facts is? <laughs> and he was looking through his file of facts and he said, um, first of all, he said, do you know the rest of that opera? And I said, well, no, but I can learn it in two weeks. He said, it doesn't need to be quite that fast. <laughs> and so he was thumbing through. He said, I have a date in December. This was in May. And he said, I have a date in December but I'd like you to come and sing the whole role on my stage. Um, at the time, the only opera that I knew all the way through was Purcell's Dido Nemeas. <laughs> wow. And I was being invited to sing that. And so I went back to my little hotel before going back to Michigan thinking, what just happened? And before I sort of, you know, took the trailway bus to go over to the, uh, LaGuardia to go back to Michigan, I called my professor of voice at um, Michigan and I said, I think I have been invited to sing in the Opera House in Berlin in December of this year. He said, what do you mean you think? <laughs> <laughs> And 
so then I told her the story, and she was as incredulous as anyone would be. And I got back to, to Michigan, and I said, what am I supposed to do now? I've got to, to learn this opera. I didn't speak German very well at all at the time. And because the Corbett's were unbelievable, they said, okay, we will give you a coach to work with once you've sort of gotten familiar, become familiar with the whole opera. And we will send you to learn conversational German at Duke University for five months. It's incredible, but that's what happened. And so I worked with this wonderful man who just happened to be from Berlin. And so we worked on conversational German. I did not know whether or not I would get to Berlin and find people that could speak English. I was going to sing a German role in a German opera house with other Germans. I thought it would be good to be able to speak with them. <laughs> And so by the time December rolled around, I was very comfortable in my role, and I have to say for the singers out there, I didn't know at the time that when you're learning an opera role, you don't have to learn everybody else's part at the same time. So I had been very busy, but at least I was comfortable in the fact that I was ready to do this for the first time on a professional opera stage. And I knew so little about being prepared once I was there and having rehearsals and so on. I didn't have the good sense to ask for a rehearsal on the actual stage. All of the rehearsal was done on the prop stage, on the rehearsal stage. And you won't believe this, the incline was about 35 degrees. So Elizabeth starts up here, and she guns out, you know, so very happy to sing De Toya Halle. And I practiced that, and that was fine. I was, you know, okay with it. At uh, 24 by then, you're not so sort of terribly worried about things. And I was very, very lucky that the person for whom the production had been created about five years before, her name was Elizabeth Brunner. And she was a fantastic singer and was a mentor to me for many years, and she was singing one evening Rosen Cavalier, and I was having a rehearsal, and she came in and she said, I want to speak with you in German. And she said, now, no one is going to tell you this, but when you're standing at the top of the stage, no one can see where your eyes are. Your head has to be up, but look at your feet. So there's not an instance where you're worried about whether or not your feet are gonna trip over what you're wearing. Now, she didn't have to be bothered to tell me that, but she did. And I've been very lucky to have singers of just a bit of a generation ahead of me who've just sort of taken me under their wings and said, now do this and don't do that. And I was very lucky to, to do that. I sang the, the, my character comes in in Tannhäuser in the second act with that beautiful aria that everybody knows. And after the second act, I was in my dressing room getting ready to turn into my nun costume because things hadn't gone well with Tannhäuser. And so I was, I was going back to the, you know, the place where I belonged and in the church. And Zay Fellner came into my dressing room after the second act and said, this is going very well. I'd like to offer you a three-year contract to sing in my opera house. <laughs> And so he had the contract there. Now, one can hardly read legalese in English. <laughs> now, I'd studied conversational German, and I knew how to conjugate verbs and so on, but this was beyond me. So I said to him at the time, thank you very, very much, but I haven't sung the third act. He said, I've been in your rehearsal, you're okay. <laughs> I mean, this actually happened. And so I, I said something to him, mumbled something like, well, I'll take this to the consulate tomorrow, the American consulate, so we can go through it so I'll know what it is I'm doing. My father had said to me long ago not to sign anything I couldn't read. <laughs> and so um, that was the beginning of my professional uh, operatic life. Phenomenal. It's nonsense, but it happened. Phenomenal. <laughs> Phenomenal. 
And you've said that you never sing in a language that you don't speak. No, I, I don't sing in a language that I haven't studied as a language. The only language in which I sing, which I don't actually speak, but can read, is Hungarian. I wanted so much to, to do a recording with Pia Boulez of Nubiad, of Bartók. And I knew that I'd be working with other Hungarians. And so I was working, to learning the, the part in Hungarian, because I'd done it in, yes, I had done it at the Met in English. And so I had a teacher in Europe, in London, and I had a teacher in New York, and they both knew where I was in sort of my, my preparation for, hung, for Hungarian. So I'd study with the person on the other side of the Atlantic when I was there, and then I'd study with the person in America when I was there. And I was very lucky that I found a driver. Can you imagine? I found a driver in New York who was Hungarian. <laughs> I bored him to tears. <laughs> sort of saying, How is, is this right? Keg sukalu, keg sukalu. He said, well, that's gonna come up a lot. It means, you know, blue beard. That's gonna come up a lot in your singing, so let's work on that. But I was very, I was very lucky in that. I, so I can read Hungarian, but I can't actually speak it. I can't hold a conversation in Hungarian. But it would no more occur to me to go on stage and sing a cycle of music in French and not know what I'm saying. I don't understand. It was someone who told me a few years ago that the National Association of Teachers of Singing, are any of you here? Um, had come across the notion that singers are so busy at school and conservatory and that we have so much to do that studying languages was no longer necessary that we could be coached as to how it goes, how it sounds, and that that was all right. I hope today they would, to today, that somebody was kidding me. Because language is our way of communication. We're not flautists. <laughs> So in order to get our music across, we have language, we have words. And if we don't know what the words mean, how can you have the fun of changing the meaning from time to time, which you might want to do? Something as simple as the, word, the words for, I use this a lot because it's, it's very easy to understand. Ich liebe dich. I love you. Now, if you don't know which part of that is the nominative and which one is the verb <laughs> and which one is the modifier, how can you change it? How can you not say, ich liebe dich? That's a completely different meaning to say, ich liebe dich. Ich liebe dich. If you don't know where you are in the sentence, how can you have fun with it? How could you not enjoy it? you're going to hopefully sing these songs more than once. Please don't tell me that you're happy to come out on stage and sing them the same way all the time, because that's the way you've learned it from your coach. <laughs> and that when you say the words von ewige Liebe, from eternal love, you don't really know what ewige means. How could you do that? Someone sitting in that audience has German as a mother tongue. And they want to feel that you know what you're singing. And it doesn't really matter. I really do feel this very strongly. It doesn't matter if the audience does not speak French, does not speak Italian, does not speak German. If you're doing the words properly, if you understand what it is you're singing, if you're giving the proper meaning to the word, they will understand what is going on. I promise you they will. And if we put aside the understanding and the necessity of understanding language, then I think we've missed the boat. It is a, even more important when I think about it than 
a pianist who learns to understand where is the, the core of the body, the scapula are down, my arms are free, everything is happening from the wrist to my fingers, they don't need my shoulders up and down. This is not participating. If you know how to do this, you can't play the Brahms piano concerto number two. You just can't. It's too hard. You'd be tired before you would have played the second movement. So those things are very necessary from a physical point of view, view playing an instrument, because that helps you to convey this incredible, this is one of my favorite concerti, the second, the Brahms. Um, to help you convey the music so that your arms are not flapping all over the place, sort of distracting from what you're doing. That is very important. What could be more important for a singer to stand in front of the audience and say, I have a story to tell. I know the story. I'm going to help you to understand the story, even though this is your language. We have to work harder. As your career progressed, and you had those wonderful first experiences, were you uh, able to say no? I think you were. Yes, I was able to say no as a youngster there in Berlin. Because you see, there were 80 operas in a year's repertoire in Berlin. There was a different opera practically in some instances every night. I went every night. I wanted to hear singers. I wanted to understand what was going on in this profession of mine. But at the same time, I noticed that there were singers that weren't that much older than I. Perhaps they were 30, a little bit over 30. But because they were singing a different opera with different requirements, too often during the course of the week, their voices sounded much older. And I was very concerned about that. And I was naive and um, improper enough to ask some of the singers, what do you sing in the course of a week? And you can't sing La Forza del Destino, Rose and Cavalier, and Aida in the same week. People, you simply cannot, and survive it. And so I took from that that it was possible to wear out a young voice. And when I was, I guess, about 25, 26 by now at the Opera House, and was offered, can you imagine at age 26, uh, to be offered a new production with some really famous conductor and some even more famous stage director to sing Kundri in Parsifal of Wagner. I've heard Leon Rusnik sing Parsifal, Kundry and, and Wagner in, in that opera, and I knew what it took. And this was an experienced singer, another one of my mentors. And it didn't take a lot of courage, perhaps it was just naivete, but I said to this wonderful man who invited me to his opera house, I don't think I should sing that. Let me sort of grow up and maybe, you know, sort of five or six, seven or eight years from now, that would be something that I sing. But please let me sing the Handel opera that I want to do. Let me go on singing Donna Elvira and the Countess in Le Nozze di Figaro. And because I wanted to be on the same stage with Birgit Nilsson, I sang the second Norn in Goethe Demero. <laughs> because we were behind the kind of, when it begins the opera the, with the Norns, and we're kind of behind the scrim, but Birgit Nielsen is just over there. <laughs> and in a moment, she's going to sing a duet with Siegfried, and they're going to end on a high C sharp to be on stage and to hear that sound that close. I can still remember it. I think my ears are still ringing from it. <laughs> but that was my experience in Berlin, and it came more often than was comfortable for me to say, no, sir, please, I really don't think I should sing that. I would just like to be a little older with a bit more experience, because I, I really don't, I don't want to, to wear it out, and I don't know how, know how else to, to help myself. 
I didn't have a coach, a vocal coach, or anything like that, sensibly, un insensibly, or stupidly, in Berlin. And so there was no one to say, this is a good idea, that's a bad idea. I had to make those decisions myself. And there came a point in Berlin where I, again, with wonderful naivete, went into the, I thought about it over the weekend, had visited some friends of mine that were teaching at the University in Heidelberg, and I told them what my plan was, and they said, you're completely crazy. And so on that Monday morning, after having been with them over the weekend, I made an appointment with Frau Ditte, that was Ze Egon Zeefeld's assistant, and I said, I need to speak to her professor. And she said, is there something wrong? I said, I don't think so. And so I went into him with my speech that I would like to leave the opera house. I'd like for time to help my voice to mature. And then I'd like to come back in some years. And in my mind, I thought he would say, oh, what a wise girl. <laughs> and uh, instead of that, he said, I'm trying to translate it into English. Are you sure this is what you want to do? And I said, yes, please. Would you allow me to do that? And he said, I don't think I have any choice. I think you've made up your mind. And from one day to the next, I was no longer a part of the Opera House in Berlin. I had, thank goodness, a little work to do in London. So that's where I went next. So what advice would you give young people now, singers who in this media culture, uh, they have to think about stardom and- Yes, absolutely. Order, as opposed to musicianship. You, you made that choice. You could have gone on and right yes. then. Well, I find it very difficult. I knew that we as singers were getting into trouble um, about, let's see, when was that, about sort of 2010. About so nine years ago, I was um, doing some master classes at a very well-known, wonderful uh, sort of school of music in the Midwest. And there were a lot of singers, and we were just having a seminar at the time. We were not having a master class. And one sort of rather sort of lovely woman stood up, and she sort of pushed her hair back, and she said, um, I want to sing, but I don't want it to interfere with my life. And after I recovered from that, <laughs> I said, uh, I think I need a further explanation as to what you mean. Well, I, I want to be able to live in the suburbs, and I want to have a few children, and, but I'd like to sing as well. I said, well, then I'm sure your church choir would be very happy to have you. <laughs> but still better, was another person, also female, who stood up to say, now, I want to, I want to really do this. I want, to, I want to do what you're doing. I said, well, very good. And so she said, I want to be really well known. In fact, I want to be famous. How do I do this? And so I asked her name, and she was called Mary Elizabeth. I said, Mary Elizabeth, I can work with you on recitatives from Mozart's operas, the De Ponte operas. I can work with you on perhaps phrasing and some of the Schubert songs that you might be singing at this point. There are things musically with which I think I've had enough experience at this point to be able to assist you. But I'm not into marketing or press and publicity. <laughs> So you need to talk to someone else about that part. And may I please say, Mary Elizabeth, if you're serious about a profession, then this isn't the way to go. This really is not it. Because if you're thinking that I'm going to do something that's going to make me famous, once you're famous, what are you going to do after that? And I knew at the time that this, what are these shows called, sort of the voice and what was the first thing that was called? So you've got talent or something like that. And I realized that the influence of these television programs 
was making us all crazy. <laughs> Thinking that all we needed to do was sing one song and do it really well and be sure to be dressed for it. <laughs> that someone would hear us and suddenly we would have a recording contract. That isn't the way life works most of the time. And so I would want my younger colleagues, I never refer to them as young singers or something, my younger colleagues to understand that if you're willing to put in the work, that this famous thing, this success thing, might just show itself. Preparation, an opportunity. This is not original from me. Preparation, an opportunity, equal success. Nothing else does. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I do tend to go on a bit. I'm sorry, Dr. No, <laughs> I... <laughs> <laughs> this is so enjoyable. I know all of you are enjoying it, but I'm just, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, and that's, what was the impetus for your Jesse Norman School of the Arts? Because you get a chance to work with young yes. people. And well, my mother always said that if you can get the attention of what we used to call juniors, Kids because between the ages of about 11 and 15, where they're no longer lap children, and they certainly don't want you to hug them in public. <laughs> but they need those hugs, they just don't know it. And hormones are breaking out everywhere. We don't know what it means. We don't know what to do with these things. And all of this is happening within your body, which is growing in a way that you never expected, not quite so quickly. And she always said, if you can get their attention at that part of their lives, then they're probably going to be all right. So the impetus for the school, I was in contact with a lot of people in Augusta, Georgia, who uh, run a foundation called the Rachel Longstreet Foundation. Rachel Longstreet is the youngest person from the Civil War who is buried in Augusta, Georgia. That was the name of the, that is the name of the foundation. And so they've always been there to help children. And so they contacted me because they wanted to talk about doing something in the arts for children. And because I always dream bigger than I'm sort of allowed, I said, well, then we need a school. We need a school for the arts, tuition free, where children because we are allowing the arts to fall out of public school education people, that we need to have a place where people who cannot afford to pay for a piano lesson, or cannot afford to pay for an, any other kind of instrumental lesson, or even have the opportunity to sing in a choir, that we need to have a school that encompasses all of the arts. We are now in our 15th academic season. The children come to us for three and a half hours after school, their regular school every day. We make sure that they're doing well academically. They have to audition and show some talent for some part of the arts, whether it's graphic art or, or dance or playing the piano or singing or whatever. And so we have photography, we have pottery making, we have drama, we have scene making, we have music, of course, and just anything else that you can imagine that occurs in the arts. We have a wonderful dance group and a wonderful group of, of faculty there. And what we have, aside from the auditions, is that we have contracts with the parents and the guardians so that whatever the students are studying with us, they should also study at home. So this year we have 100, I think we have 137 children during the week 
and many more on the weekends. And then we have uh, three summer sessions. And um, it just happens that we, were, we started out in the Sunday school rooms of the uh, St. John Church on Green Street in Augusta. One of our board members, Patricia Knox, um, has a son who's involved in real estate. And she came to me one day, she said, I'm going to talk to Peter about doing something for the school. I said, well, that's wonderful. And um, a while after that, she came back to me to say, I've done it. He's going to give you the building across the street for your school. Nice. Wow. So now we have a building with our name on it and everything. Oh. It's like a school. So, it's incredible. And, and as uh, young people, and I know there are young people in the audience that wanted to, to hear you talk about your life and your career, yes. what advice would you give them about being able to give back to the community like Oh, today? I think it's extremely important. I, I love those children collectively and individually because first of all, they're so happy to be able to expand themselves in this way. They're so wonderfully supportive of one another. And of course, their parents are overjoyed that they have this opportunity. I was in Toronto in um, February, and the foundation that was sponsoring the trip, the Glenn Gould Foundation, they were offering me a, a recognition at that time. Um, they actually paid for 12 of my students to come to Toronto. I mean, these kids had never had passports. And there they were with passports and everything. And I was so pleased to have them. They were going to study four days with students the same age as they in Toronto, which was a wonderful experience for them. And I was very pleased that our students were really very good. <laughs> and I would like to, to say to anybody that wants to give back to the community that helped you make you to do something. It doesn't have, you don't have to create a school, but you can perhaps give a few hours a week as a volunteer at the elementary school, at the preschool. They need volunteers in every kind of school. And if you've got a few hours a week where you can go in and help out with one of the teachers or whatever they need doing, that's, that would be a wonderful way of giving back. That wouldn't mean that you'd have to go out and raise money, which I do on a daily basis. Um, and it is, I feel, important and I grew up with this. I mean, my sister Elaine is here. She knows that our parents were involved in what was going on in Augusta, Georgia all the time. I mean, my mother was at a polling station whenever there was something to do. I mean, she registered people to vote in 1965. I was a student. I came home from Howard University and went with her every day to the church to sit at one of those tables and to sort of write on the three by five cards the name and addresses of people who registered to vote. And there was, at one point, I think Elaine said to her, sort of later on in her years, do you have to go to the polling station this year? Aren't you tired of this? She said, absolutely not. <laughs> and so there you were. I learned this very early, and I would like us to understand. It doesn't have to be a big thing. I tell my children, and I call them my children, that you don't have to do something major every day. But maybe there's a, a woman who lives upstairs in your building, and she's not in her first bloom, and she's carrying her groceries that are just a little heavy. Just say, Ms. Reynolds, can I take these up the stairs for you? Or something that we can do which always startles. I love doing this, being in a, an office building in New York City where everybody's looking at the numbers, nobody's talking to anyone. I love getting on the elevator saying, good morning. <laughs> and without fail, somebody says, she must be from out of town. <laughs> <laughs> so be from out of town and say hello to a stranger. It will brighten your day and certainly in, in brighten that person's day. Miss Norman. You have brightened our day. Oh, you're very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank 
Thank you so much. Thank you for letting me go on a bit. I've enjoyed it. <laughs> well, your gift, and you're still giving, you give with the school, and now your gift of your collection for generations to come, sharing mm. your life and your career with so many people. This is we so can't humbling, thank you I enough. cannot begin to explain the honor that I feel and the joy and the gratefulness, the thankfulness that it with, is within me to think that my scratched up papers and various things will land in this library. I discovered the Library of Congress when I was a student at Howard University. I had to take two buses to get here, but I came. <laughs> the reading room was wonderful. And imagine, as I say all the time at age 18, I guess I was a sophomore by then, that you would come to the library, to the reading room, to the research library, and you'd be invited to sit at a table, and someone would come and ask you what books you wanted. I thought the Dewey Decimal System and I would become great friends <laughs> at the Library of Congress, but that isn't the way it worked. And so every time that I could, and that was always preparing for examinations, I'd take those two buses and come and sit there all day in peace and quiet, not with my roommate. <laughs> and for fair, for one of the exams I loved the most, I had a fantastic teacher, Doris McGinty was a, a teacher of lit music literature. Doris McGinty, I'll just talk very, very shortly about her. Doris McGinty had the kind of mind where she'd be in the middle of a sentence and she would say, for instance, the um, romantic area, the classical era, is said to begin about sort of 1750. And somebody would rap on the door needing to see her, to have her attention. And she'd come back in the room and say, and we call it the end about 1827. Wow. How could you not want to prepare for that class? She was fabulous. And as you, and we've talked about the fact that through a very generous gift, uh, the Wellborns have uh, really sponsored and will sponsor paid internships for Howard University stewards students to work on your archives. This is wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. And we'll try to get transportation. <laughs> <laughs> well, the buses work is fine. It's probably a lot more expensive than 75 cents. But Ms. Norman, <laughs> we can't thank you enough. And I hope that you know that um, even though I've been sitting here and enjoying it, and I know that everyone here has enjoyed you sharing and letting us get to know you. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you.